what's the importance of habits and what's the importance of understanding how they work? Or let's say the title of the talk is addictions, which is essentially a, a severe form of a habit that you just can't shake. What's the importance of learning how to break habits? The importance of any subject, of any knowledge is based on what it leads to. So if what it leads to is important, then learning that knowledge is important. So for example, the knowledge of our beliefs. These are important because it leads to knowledge of Allah and it leads to sa'adah in the, in the afterlife, happiness and success. So that's an important knowledge. It's not a, um, a knowledge we can dismiss. We can't get through this life without that. Similarly, habits are important. Specifically, learning about if we have really bad habits that are pre preventing us from what we're trying to do in life. So there's, uh, we've been created for the worship of Allah. We know that. That doesn't need to be brought up. But what it, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I haven't created people except to worship me, except for ibadah. So our job is ibadah. Whether we're a doctor, lawyer, student, our job is ibadah. That's the job that we've been assigned for. And ibadah is two things. It's doing whatever, it's whatever Allah descri describes it as. Ibadah is doing what he asks for us and leaving what he wants us to leave. So coming back to what I was initially talking about, the importance of Learning about our habits is, is just that. Being able to learn how to create habits around what Allah asks of us and being able to break habits that are related to what Allah doesn't want from us. So because this is related to happiness in the next life, it's all the more important. Sometimes we find ourselves with habits that we just can't break. We want to break them. We've decided to break them. If there was a, th if we can put 50% of our bank account in it and break it, we would do it. But we just can't break it. So then it becomes more of a question of strategy, uh, oftentimes rather than effort. So, what's the importance of this knowledge? It's based on happiness in the afterlife by doing what Allah asks of us and leaving what He doesn't ask for us. But it's also about happiness in this life because what Allah commands of us and what he tells us to leave, it's not a, for his benefit. It's for our benefit, not just in the next life, but in this life. Allah tells us not to steal. Allah tells us not to be dishonest. Allah tells us to take care of our family. These are things that benefit us in this life. These are things that benefit us in this life. Everything that Allah commands us to or prohibits us from are things that are beneficial for us. And being able to cultivate good habits and understand how habits work and why we want to do one thing but our habits drive us somewhere else, understanding that phenomenon is really important for us to be successful, not only in the next life, but successful in this life. If you want to be successful at school, if you want to be su successful at your job, your career, if you want to be successful at anything in this life, it's a, your health. Your health is a culmination of your habits. If you want to be successful at anything in this life, it's important to understand how habits work, how to make them work for you, and when they're working against you, how to break them. Uh, so not only is it about happiness in the next life, it's about happiness in this life to achieve our goals, but then with the worship of Allah, with the relationship with Allah, that's when real happiness comes. There's nothing out there for us. Money, prestige, what, shopping, uh, these material things, two cents. It's nothing compared to the relationship with Allah, with the remembrance of Allah, with cultivating that connection. 
And you can spend your whole life trying to figure that out just to confirm that point. All right, so habits, important for the next life, for this life. It's also important because in the day we live in right now, particularly right now, there's a lot of people interested in how you and me cultivate habits so they can induce certain habits within us. So whether that be your shopping habits, whether that be your eating habits, whether that be your internet habits. Because if you go to X site or Y site, then we're able to advertise certain things. Let me fix it. Okay, we'll leave it, shall I? If we go to, I said advertising. What was on the back? Was it was something, was something, is the name of the, the must, okay. That's a good thing to org uh, to advertise, to, to let people know about, but okay. So we have to understand habits because the people who are around us, a lot of the issues we're going to have to deal with in order to achieve our uh, goals and be successful as Muslims is going to be around understanding how to deal with habits and understanding that on the other end, the enemy or the people that might be getting in the way of our goals understands habits really well on a very deep psychological level. So it's going to be important for us to understand how that works. Okay, so everything that we discuss moving forward in terms of how do habits work, why do addictions occur, why do habits happen where we can't shake them, everything that we're going to learn moving forward, these are all things that the people that are trying to market these habits towards us to make them as sticky as possible. This is, these are things that they know. So it, it's important for us to, to be on par with that. So for example, pornography habit. If somebody has a pornography habit, there's a very concerted and deep marketing campaign behind pushing that around the world. It's not an afterthought. This is a billion dollar industry with a, uh, a, a marketing and psych psychology sort of understanding that's gonna be important for us to, to, uh, to understand in order for us to be able to help our habits. Okay, why, why do things become addictive? Why do we develop bad habits? Or let's just back up, what is addiction? What is a bad habit? Addiction is when the definition of it is essentially when you lose control over a particular habit or when you continue to use despite consequences. So there's part of that that has to do with inside, a, lo a loss of control within me over a particular habit. And part of it has to do with the outside, continued consequences. So the consequences keep building up. People find out about it, I get in trouble. The consequences keep building up until um, you would think any, any person without the addiction would tap out. Any person without that bad habit would stop. Uh, but the person with addiction, with the habit that's become so ingrained, they'll continue to engage in that habit. Okay, so that's addiction. Addiction, I wouldn't get too technical about it because the best you can do with addiction is, is basically distinguish it from other things. So you can say, oh, well, I'm addicted to coffee because this is what comes up. Oh, well, I'm addicted to chocolate. Well, we're not talking about any habit or let's say if you consider that a bad habit, any bad habit, we're concerned with a specific type of habit um, that results in a loss of control and continued consequences, significant consequences. Okay. So that's, that's addiction. What's important to understand about addiction or any habit in general is it has to have a reward for the habit to work. No good habit, no bad habit is going to take without a reward. No addiction will develop without a reward. What's the reward of shopping? Getting what you, sh that, that glorious item that you were looking for and searching for, and then you order it online, and then it comes to fruition when you get the package, you open the package, and you get what you want, and you find out it's too small, and you have to send it back anyway. But it comes to fruition 
when you get that reward, what's the reward of, let's say, for example, playing games on your cell phone? It's that reward of achievement. Or let's say, what's the reward of social media? I post something, somebody likes it, somebody sees it. These are engineered rewards to keep you coming back. Because once they have your eye, once they have your eyes and attention, that's when they slip in whatever they're trying to sell you. So without a reward, you can put it a different way. If you remove the reward completely, you're, you would no longer seek that out. If somehow in your brain you remove rewards, you would, you, you would no longer seek things out. They, they looked at laboratory mice that were engineered to remove the reward chemical from their brain, dopamine. These mice no longer had, let's say, quote unquote, just to keep it simple, a chemical that would reward them for whatever, they, whatever action they would take. So these mice wouldn't even have the motivation to shuffle a few feet to get food that was placed right in front of them. We can't do this to humans, but you can imagine if you took away the reward from any habit, you would take away that habit. So now, what, what can you learn from that? If you take the reward away from a habit, you can stop that habit. If you add a reward to a good habit, you can really instill good habits within yourself. Okay. Right now, we have an unprecedented addiction to not only drugs and alcohol, but all types of digital devices. So there's pornography, gambling, shopping, um, and then you can, you can consider social media and those things uh, 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 an addictive problem. But if you, just, if you just look around you, it becomes clear. Anybody that asks, well, are cell phones addicti uh, addictive? Are cell phones addictive? A lot of times you can just respond to them with, just look around. Just look around. Um, so there's three reasons for why there's a mass increase in addiction. One, number one reason is accessibility. There has been no time where addictive substances, addictive stimuli, addictive rewarding um, digital devices have been more accessible than now. There's no time where you could gamble at, the, at your fingertips, look at pornography at your fingertips, shop at your fingertips, order food at your fingertips, um, play games at your fingertips, so on and so forth. The more accessible a reward is, this is the first principle, the more likely an addiction will develop. So for example, cigarettes, you can take cigarettes for an, for an example. Cigarettes in before the 1800s, you would roll a cigarette and you would smoke it. If you have some extra, you might give it out. At, in the late 1800s, they developed a, a, a cigarette rolling machine. And in the 1900s, right, you were able to roll 20,000 cigarettes it, like that, thousands and thousands of cigarettes. And now we have trillions of cigarettes are sold each year. And now you have a smoking epidemic, the number one cause of, of death, of preventable death, is smoking. Despite us knowing all the harms of it, it's still smoking year after year, even to this year. Why did that happen? Because access increased. Do you understand the point? When access to something increases, on a societal level, addictions increase or bad habits increase. Similarly, let's say, for example, pornography. And I'm going to come back to this point again and again because when we talk about behavioral addictions, which is the topic today, that's sort of the cardinal behavior addiction. That's sort of the addiction that we, th th that's heard about the most when it comes to behavioral addiction. 25% of Google searches are for pornography. 12% of, of the internet is pornographic content. It's not just not uh, outside of our community. These are high numbers within the Muslim community. And there's a lot of data now to support this of Muslims in Muslim majority countries and 
and Muslims in general. So this is a large societal, not even societal, it's a universal global problem. Um, and it's something to be um, kept in mind about in order to protect our families. If you're going to raise children, there's no way you can't keep this problem in mind. How would you even do that? If you're going to um, try to navigate this society uh, and make it to 20, 25 without any sort of, it's, it's going to be really important to understand the principles of bad habits in general and uh, social media, so on and so forth. Everything that we talk about in terms of, let's say, pornography addiction or any addiction, you can apply that to any rewarding um, substances. So any rewarding habits uh, can have these sort of um, principles applied to them. So you don't want to say, okay, smoking addiction, marijuana addiction, social media addiction. Maybe I don't have that, but maybe I have a food addiction. Maybe, maybe I don't have this addiction. Maybe I have another addiction. What you want to do is take the principles of what we're discussing now and apply it to whatever we have going on in our own individual lives. Um, I can't imagine there's hardly a person out there that hasn't have some interaction with some compulsive habit in the world that we live in today um, that, they, that they don't have to deal with, that they're not trying to get over. Um, okay, so access, understanding that. On a societal level, when access increases, addictions increase, bad habits increase. The same goes reverse. When access, and this is the point I want to drive home, when you reduce access, then um, addictions decrease in societies. So Vietnam vets, we'll talk about drug addiction because those are really highly rewarding substances. But don't think, oh, there's drugs. That has nothing to do with what we're struggling with in terms of our habits. Drugs are just a one rewarding substance, and then we're dealing with our own digital or other rewarding substances or habits. Vietnam vets, when they came back to the United States, that were addicted to heroin, they looked at Vietnam vets that were addicted to heroin, 90% of them, their addiction resolved just by losing their access to their drug. That's unheard of. Can you imagine that in our time where you hear about the opioid epidemic all the time in the news? Can you imagine if we just removed all the access somehow, um, this problem would essentially resolve? It's so much so that if you understand access to these habits and problems, you understand addiction or bad habits, and everything else is a footnote. So if you can really understand this problem, if you can really understand access, then you can have a, a really good understanding of the foundations of this type of problem, of bad habits and addictions in general, digital chemical addictions. OK. Similarly, laboratory rats. They get laboratory rats addicted to all types of substances, all types of chemicals. This is important to understand. If we can get them interested in social media, we would, but we can't do that to laboratory rats. They just don't take to Facebook. So, but, but the way they study these laboratory rats is they give them chemical rewards because we can't give them other rewards. Their brain don't, brains don't work like that. So they give them chemical rewards like drugs and so on and so forth. What they find is after a few weeks, after a, a period of time, they teach these animals to push a lever to get a substance. Push a lever, get a substance. Push a lever, get a substance. Okay, so what happens after a while is they these animals, they keep pushing the lever, keep pushing the lever. They develop a habit because they have a rewarding substance. They have access to it, unlimited access. And they push the uh, lever to the verge of death. When they remove access, they push the lever, they don't get anything. No reward. The same behavior, but no reward. They just took the reward out of it. These laboratory rats, their habit, they, they're obsessed with the lever for, for a few weeks, and then the habit slowly resolves and goes away. The habit slowly goes away. So it's not the, the behavior. Forget the behavior. Is it a chemical? What kind of digital problem is it? Forget it. It's the reward. It's the reward. And when you couple that reward to any habit, then the person will keep coming back to that. And, um, and that's, that's important to understand. OK, so the reward is important. 
access to that reward is important. The, the second point I want to make about access before we move on to the next point is that access is not only geographical access. So let me put it like this. You can use these to develop good habits too, by the way. So if you want to eat healthy as opposed to um, unhealthy, put the food, the junk food in the garage or put it in the trunk of the car. Make it harder to get to and put healthy food in the house. Put the, you know, the, the bad food farther away, a couple barriers to get to it and get healthy food, put it in the house, put it in the uh, fridge, put it in the kitchen where it's accessible. Also with, um, if you're studying, you want to keep your study environment clean or work. You want to keep your work environment clean. So just maybe keep the book there if that's all you need to study. And then the computer, if you can do the work off of the computer where you don't have access to whatever your assignment is and then you click on something else. It's just so close. Like even if it's a game or a movie or something like that, if you can keep uh, access to um, away from the bad habits or the things that are pulling you, you'll be more likely to develop um, to, 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 to disrupt those bad habits and then also develop good habits. So it's not only geographical access, it's also psychological access. And this is important to understand. So before 20 years ago, marijuana, you would use marijuana and you would just say, okay, I'm using drugs. That's it. I'm just using drugs. This is the decision I've made. Now, it's not psychologically sort of like this bad thing, or I'm using a drug. Now you start off with, oh, I'm just using this medication. It just has CBD in it, or it has, doesn't have cannabis in it. It just has a chemical part of cannabis, but you know it's okay. It doesn't get you high. And then you take that for a while, and uh, there's my favorite brand went out. Now that it only has 10% in it, 10% of the bad stuff, THC but 90% CBD, really a lot of these products that have 100% CBD, when they do the studies, that actually it does have THC in it, which is that chemically reactive, the, the part of um, cannabis that gets you high, THC. And then you, you, THC, and then you're doing this what? For chronic pain, for sleep, for you name it. There you've, you go to the farmer's market or something, you get a can, one of those cannabis files, uh, flyers, it solves everything. Marital problems, it'll pay your mortgage, it'll do everything. Cannabis. So you start with a pill, then you know you, you can um, take another step and another step, and it slowly just becomes easier and easier to eventually use an edible, which is 100% cannabis, and then slowly gets easier to, well, why not just buy less and use more potent forms? You can apply this to everything. So not only is there geographical access, Psychologically, it's become easier. We've lowered the barrier to considering these things bad. Similarly with pornography. Okay, I'm, I'm watching TV or I'm watching maybe not TV, uh, something else. And then I watch a show that's, okay, pretty clean. Then I might watch a show that's kind of not. Then we just end up somewhere else. And then it ends up, uh, you know, the website. And then you're looking at something, you're not even looking at, at this other thing, and then you eventually find yourself someplace that you weren't necessarily trying to get to. And that's bit by bit. Take prescription medications, for example. This whole opioid epidemic that we're facing now, it's all related to prescribing opioids initially. So you see this mass prescribing of opioids by physicians that occurred because it was safe. It's okay, it's safe. It was marketed well. It had a great marketing team behind it. They knew how to, what to say to the doctors and make it stick, make them feel okay about it. Doctors pump it out. Then prescription opioids, all of a sudden, they're not good anymore. And all, all of a sudden, people find it a little bit okay to use opioids for reasons other than prescribe or then get them from non-medical sources. And then you have another wave of a heroin epidemic after the prescription opioid epidemic, then you have this fentanyl epidemic. Shay'an for shay'an, little by little, step by step, shaitan takes us. And this is something to be really important, uh, uh, careful about in these times. Because if we're going to make it out, these are the times where you have to sort of be street smart. You sort of can't be 
just going along with it. You got to have a little bit of street smarts to make it out now and uh, understand the game. So psychological access reduces and it becomes easier to gain these things. So now you have geographical access is everywhere. Psychological access is not so bad. It cures something or maybe it helps me to be, you know, do something. Uh, it helps my pain or my sleep so I can be a better person. And then, um, and then you have digital access, which we discussed. There's things you know you would never imagine doing 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and now, you know, you you just it's right there in your pocket, everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. And that's important because part of the reason why when we when we encounter people, when I when I work with people who have addictions, part of the reason. Uh, people have such a difficult time, is this issue of access. And that's why I'm spending so much time on this one piece, to understand that it's almost as if bad habits and addiction, the whole issue is access. Everything else is footnotes. There's a lot to be said about it. But, you know, access is, is really important. Okay, once you have it really clear, really firm in your mind, the access issue, then you use that for your sake. So like we mentioned, you bring access of things that are good, good habits, you put barrier, barriers up for bad habits, but then you have to understand those three aspects. So let's start with digital access, okay? So understanding digital access, the immediacy of all these rewards, it's like a, a, a needle ready to immediately give you whatever you want, shopping, food, and so on and so forth. Highly rewarding, highly potent um, drugs. Okay, look, you have drugs, you can smoke drugs. It's all the brain. That, that's where you have to understand. That's where this is all happening. Okay, you can inhale a drug. It goes into your lungs. You have these little, um, you know, balls in, in your lungs that have blood vessels in it. The smoke goes into those blood vessels travels to your, goes through the blood, travels to your brain. The, the, the end point is the brain. Okay, you know, know about people that inject drugs. They take a drug, they inject it into their veins, it goes faster. It goes into the bloodstream, goes into the brain. Or you can have a drug, it hits your eye. It goes into the back of your retina, bypasses the blood uh, carrier system, goes directly into your retina. Your retina translate that. To, to, to electrical signals, and it goes directly into your brain. And it, it activates the same areas in the brain that heroin does, or cannabis, or marijuana, or drugs do. So you have to understand the issue is reward, and the issue is access. And when you understand that, then you understand how dangerous, let's say, if you do develop a habit with something over the internet, how dangerous having a phone in your pocket all the time is. Okay, so you understand access, the importance of it. Now you use it for your sake. So digital access, putting up barriers to digital access. If you do happen to have this a problem with internet, let's say, let's say pornography, because that's a cardinal example that we said that we would use. But you can apply this to anything, food shopping, anything. If you happen to have this problem, then what you need to do first, first thing you need to do is block access. You got to block access digitally. So just like the laboratory rats push the lever and they don't get the reward and then they get bored with the lever, your cell phone, you have to figure out a way to make it less rewarding. So there's all types of, this is a it's a rahmah, it's mercy from Allah. It's all types of responses to this to block things on your phone, block things on your laptops, you first of all, remove as many devices as you need, just leave what you need, and then whatever devices are remaining, you want to put a lot of um, barriers on that. So there's a lot of software you can use. There's a whole host of things. It's sufficient to say there's enough stuff out there to digitally block your device to, pre to, to pre prevent uh, issues from happening, 
So parents and families should understand that for their kids. Again, 90% of people um, have uh, looked at these things, are pornography by ages of 16, 18. This is in populations that include Muslims. But if you look at Muslim-only populations, the numbers are staggering, and there's data out now showing that. All right, so nobody's safe from these things, and it's important to have honest conversations about them so that we can start thinking about the solution. So number one, preventing these problems from happening by creating, like monitoring uh, devices, parental controls, so and so restrictions on internet as kids are growing up in these environments. And then number two, um, if you do stumble into this problem, recognizing that a huge part of it is going to be figuring out a way to block that access. And so if you find yourself constantly trying to get out of this problem, constantly trying to figure it out, making promises to yourself that you'll never do it again, whatever the problem is, and it doesn't happen, you know, maybe you get a month of success, three months of success, six months, a year, it comes back, comes back. Consider that having a needle with the drug of choice in your pocket is not a good idea. Or having a cell phone with your drug of choice is not a good idea. Uh, or having a digital device in your pocket with immediate access 24-7 to a highly rewarding, potent drug that no natural human being would be able to handle if they had been wired to become addicted to some sort of digital reward. Consider taking steps first to um, create some space there. So that's digital uh, access, breaking that digital access. Then you can think about geographic access, uh, breaking that for the digital devices as well specifically. So there's people use safes. Sometimes people use safes. They're safes specifically for cell phones. You come home, you drop it into the safe, or you create, you create um, what are they called, um, cell phone free zones in your house. Leave the cell phone in the car, garage, so on, so on and so forth. There's many things you can come up with. We'll touch on a few things. But you can think of this as a whole area of exploration for you, if this is a problem for you, where you can get creative and just um, get it done. Get it done in the sense that block that access, because that's the goal. You don't want to just create things uh, that don't actually get the job done. So that's uh, blocking that geographical access. OK, uh, and then we talked about digital access, blocking that digital access. And there's other ways to, to monitor your internet usage or having other people help you monitor that usage, which brings me to the second point. So we talked about what? Number one, access. That's the reason why we're in this age that we're in with addiction epidemics, the addiction age. Number two um, is um, anonymity. So being able to do these things and nobody knows about that. So being able to shop uh, for things, nobody knows about that. So maybe you don't need that extra third thing, and you probably wouldn't have bought it anyway, but because it's immediately accessible, scroll, 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 buy. And then number two, nobody's there to sort of judge you for getting it. Uh, it, it can be uh, easier to, 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 to purchase those things. But more important, anonymity and any of these digital problems that we have. So let's say, for example, going back to um, the pornography problem. Let's say, for example, 50 years ago, you would have to go to a location to get these things. That would subtract the vast majority of people that would have ever gotten into this problem in the first place. Maybe 80% of those people. But now, um, because of uh, anonymity, not just access, but anonymity, Nobody knows about it. I can get in and get out. Nobody will ever know. Allah will know. You'll know. You'll know amongst yourself. And that has a deep psychological effect. Don't, don't think that that doesn't. Um, and don't think that you won't be so much happier if you broke these chains. You may only know how happy you can be until you break those chains and look back. Um, so anonymity, recognizing that a vast majority of people 
only develop this problem because they can get in and out without having to deal with um, without without anybody seeing them. So now, how do we how do we leverage this to prevent digital and behavioral addictions, and then how to recover from digital and behavioral addictions? Number one, break that anim anonymity. So parental controls, monitoring your children's um, screen time, keeping an eye on that is very important. So even if like you have these digital um, TV um, subscriptions, you can always create kids accounts. You can monitor what they're watching with the internet. You can block from the Wi-Fi, from the uh, from the computer itself, from the cell phone itself, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of ways to um, make no longer keep it anonymous. The second thing is if you have this problem. The, the, so if you have this problem, then to invite accountability into your life. So you can tell people, you can confide into somebody who might be able to help you with this problem. We have an addiction clinic. There are many clinics, therapists out there you can talk to. You can go and talk with um, people in your community who you feel you can help, who can help you. There's other people that are going through this problem or problems like this, digital problems, food addiction shopping problems, uh, other behavioral addictions. You can find a group for, for any of these. And what, what you get from this is time-tested or practical advice. If you know somebody who's been through it and gone, gotten out of it, that's going to be much more convincing than you know somebody talking about it from a scientific, theoretical point of view. So inviting, breaking the anonymity by getting um, help or confiding with somebody or having a coach. And if you can't do that, that's fine. There's other ways to invite uh, accountability into your life. You can find accountability problem, partners. You can add uh, monitoring to your internet um, so that you, you, know, you, you can't do things um, anonymously, so on and so forth. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention is you can also get laptops and phones and devices that are you don't have to block things on them. They come like that. So there's one kosher cell phones, I can't remember, kosher devices, where they are able to send you devices that have this. Or you can get basic phones. It's a whole horde of people getting basic phones now just because they want to break free of this. They don't conceptualize it as a me problem. They conceptualize it as a societal problem. You know, before when a... Um, an empire wanted to rule a people, two th uh, you know, 2,000 years ago, they would come in with sheer force through the front door, and they'd make an example. And they, they would break the wills of people. The, 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 the goal wasn't to kill people, because that they could potentially serve as your workforce. The goal was to break their will psychologically. Warfare develops, as it always does. That's the way of the world. Then you have more of like a colonial type regime, right? Where it's less about sheer force and it's, it's about creating dependence in relationships. So creating economic dependence on a colonial power to the point where now you sort of lost your autonomy as your own state. And now we're in an age where you don't really need to go far to develop dependence and debt in people and get them um, hooked and break their will to do whatever you want. So there's a whole horde of people just getting basic phones, disattaching, disconnecting, because they don't see it as a problem for themselves or a problem of society. They feel like they're fighting something that's more important. So disconnecting. So you have the digital access, you have the geographical access, that the cell phones, I think that's important to mention that there's, you can actually buy cell phones and devices. You can actually buy these devices pre-packaged. I think you should buy them for kids and, and, and yourselves if, if you're having these problems, but children just to kind of give them a chance to um, 
learn how to use their devices responsibly. Access accessibility, anon uh, anonymity. Third thing is affordability. So all these digital, and we'll, we'll wrap up with this. All these issues um, are incredibly affordable. So if you're able to, so pornography, free, uh, social media, free, but you pay for it with your attention, your time, because that's what they want, essentially, because that's how they slip in other things to sell you. Um, affordability. So what you want to do is you want to leverage that. If, if, if studies repeatedly show that if they put taxes on, let's say, alcohol or other rewarding devices, consumption decreases. Or if they increase prices of addictive things, prices decrease. So you can leverage that to your advantage. You can, you know, anytime that you engage in an addictive habit or a, a habit that's bad, charge yourself. Say, I'm going to pay $100 or $50 or $20 every time this happens. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just commit to doing that. And just, uh, just like a scientist, commit to that for a couple months and see how that affects your behavior. And then also sometimes people use what they call anti-charities. So they'll you know, pay to something that they're vehemently against. So you know, they're, let's say they don't like um, you know, eating animals. So then they'll pay to a charity where you know, that's pro you know, encouraging people <laughs> to eat animals or something like that. So this is a, a trick. It's like a behavioral economics trick to help deter yourself from these behaviors or to bind yourself or punish yourself or give yourself consequences in other ways. We'll talk about denial. This is probably the biggest issue that I face once people are dealing or thinking about this as a problem with families or themselves. You gotta understand, denial is not necessarily consciously choosing to tune out or pretend like it's not a problem for you. Denial is much more sophisticated than that. Denial can be sometimes completely subconscious. So let's say somebody who has a trauma and they're a kid, they're a 10-year-old and they go through a traumatic experience, or a five-year-old that go through a traumatic experience, their subconscious, without their approval, can completely deny that that happened. It has a logical intention. It's to s support the child from uh, distressing thoughts. But that can also happen subconsciously with people with other distressing thoughts. So I'm the important person, but then I also have this pornography problem. So how do I bridge that? Sometimes what can happen is subconsciously, people just delete this part of their life. Or if it's not visible or public, it doesn't really exist. Or, you know, the large percentage, because this isn't a problem that just affects men. This affects women as well. So it's, this is a human problem. So, you know, like, let's say, for example, um, fantasy novels as a gateway drug for people to then develop other harder drugs. This is sort of just the, the issue of our times. So, you know, what can be helpful when we're in that state of denial is instead of, I'm this important person, how can I have this problem? Have a little mercy on yourself. Recognize that you're a human and we're not that important. We're not as important as we think we are. So have some mercy on yourself. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be the perfect person. I don't, whatever your role is in society, it's, it's more important for uh, you to be happy with yourself than to have to hold this perfect image up and then delete anything that doesn't correspond with that. So having some mercy on yourself, having some compassion on yourself, can be really helpful to then acknowledge this problem. So that's subconscious denial. Then you can have a type of denial that's a little bit more conscious, where you're minimizing the problem. You're saying something like, okay, it's a problem, but at least it's not as bad as Zina. As, at least I'm not going and having um, like a marital affair or extramarital affair or something along those lines, because this comes up. So, you know, as if like that person, you know, he's got people lining up at his door or something like that. So a lot of times this can simply just be a denial mechanism, a, a, a mechanism to minimize. At least it's not that bad. If you find yourself saying, at least it's not that bad, that can be a sign that you're in denial uh, and you're minimizing the problem. 
or if you find yourself, another sign of denial is find yourself just doing the same thing over and over again, caught in the same loop, expecting different results. That could be a sign that you're in a denial of what the severity of the problem is or exactly how the problem works, whatever the habit is. And then you have a type of denial where you just transfer the blame on somebody else. You say, this is a problem with my child, but it's the society, or it's not my problem, or what can I do? I don't know enough about the problem. Or the person themselves with the problem says, this is a problem with me, but it's because of the society, or it's because I'm not married yet. When I get married, this is no longer going to be a problem, so on and so forth. So in summary, to understand how to prevent and to treat this problem, it's important to understand the reasons for the problem on a society level and an individual level. And then number two, to really face the problem. Because denial, statistically, people are struggling with this problem. And denial is something that is important to engage with in order to deal with this. So the, the solution is threefold. Number one, make a, a strong nia and intention. When you make an intention to acknowledge and deal with the problem, you're automatically breaking out of that denial. It's between you and Allah. Because although everybody might not see us, Allah sees us. He's going to be there. We're, we're going towards Him. We're on a moving train towards Him. We have to figure it out quick. We got to figure it out. Um, so number one, Nia. Number two, knowledge. In our tradition, it's always ilm before amal. You got to know how to act before you just haphazardly act. This comes in everything. If you want to become a lawyer, you got to, there's a whole period where you learn and then you act. So everything that I discussed with you, you can't, beat up a 30-year marketing strategy with the most brilliant minds and a billion dollars behind it with a 20-minute talk. All of these topics, if you're struggling with this problem or you're worried about raising a family in this environment, all of these points that I've listed, this is surface. There's a whole area to go deep into in order to really understand this problem for yourself. And you have to develop a kind of mastery over it. If you're stuck in this problem, you have to develop a mastery over it to really understand it. And then number three, action. Mujahada. You're going to lose sometimes and you're going to win sometimes. They got to stay in the ring and keep uh, fighting. And that's, that's better than, um, than not. Um, if we have any questions we can ask, otherwise we'll wrap up.